He now has blackmail on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Coming at this on from you, a position not me. of power. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. So yeah, I guess I guess we should settle on a skill that we want to be the uh, the overarching kind of like theme for Joseph's progression, um, and then you had mentioned like Jason Rao and and trying to incorporate them into the video, and I'm thinking like. The first part will just basically be about Joseph's training methodology um, and how he likes to develop skills. And then I think the second part will be like your coaching methodology and you can give examples and that's where we can like bring in like Jason Rao and other people um, and just talk about like how you like to go strategizing for, for matches and things like that. Um, and then we'll talk about We'll kind of like bring it back to Joseph and then um, kind of talk about how you guys went about coming up with the strategy for, for ABCC. Um, and then I think that's the time where we can introduce that idea of like confidence um, versus um, like efficient routes. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, kind of like I already kind of outlined it. You already started to know this, um, but yeah. So what skill do you guys think? Okay, yeah, uh, let's stay with what we were talking about because one of the most important skills that we worked on for ADCC is not getting entangled. So I think we should go with this at the first, as the first skill. Oh well, yeah, I'm not opposed. Another one I wanted to talk about, Demo, was also the staying on top because this I think was also something yes. fairly notable, especially in the Taza match. So I think we can probably yes. talk about that. A fair bit. Uh, yes. Maybe there's a way to uh, like combine the skills, like in the sense that like you want to put like pressure on your opponent to prevent them from standing up, but you don't want to allow them to get underneath you and start to enter into your legs. So maybe there's a way to combine those two skills and talk about them in a way where. Um, yeah, you're trying to avoid entanglements while also preventing them from, from standing up. Um, that'd yes. be the way to approach the it. Big, the, the big issue with that is, like, you have to choose one over the other. You can also do 50-50, but then you encounter both problems of the styles. So if you want to keep people down, you need more connection, right? So you probably need to be a little bit closer. And if you don't want to get entangled, like it comes at the price that your partner can stand up. So if the strategy is to stay on top and we know that the other partner doesn't want to wrestle with us, that's where we apply this strategy. And when we think that the partner wants to stand up, then we get a little bit closer to holding people down. I think, Would you agree, Joseph? Yeah, I think it's like you can introduce the idea of like context, right? Because um, especially we, we're more geared towards one versus the other in different contexts. So like like a good example would be like Tommy versus Taza one was clearly trying to get up a lot more than and then even with Mateus as well right like Mateus wasn't like there were a few attempts for him to get up but they weren't as like uh, persistent as Taza's and, and you could also make the contrast to Lamp or that really didn't try to get up at all and then like you could say okay the context of the situation will determine also but, yeah so I, that, I would say let's start with the first skill, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, do, uh, do you ask questions or should Joseph talk or should I talk? Like, how should we do? Yeah, maybe we just have a conversation. Um, I'm thinking, I ideally I think it would be less of me talking in the video and, and my voice is just kind of used to make the transitions better or maybe like, you know, uh, highlight some like details or something that I see while I'm assembling the match footage or something like that. Um, okay. But I, I would prefer to basically um, have you basically just talk about your training method and then I can assemble footage around that. So do you want me to like ask questions or what? Yeah, maybe, like maybe some prompts per se. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe we can start like with the script. It was in the beginning that we talk about the skill that Joseph really needed to win ADCC trials, right? 
So maybe I can start with that, and then Joseph will elaborate on his training methods to develop that skill. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, I just start. So Joseph Chen is, in my opinion, one of the most skilled grapplers in the world. I already knew that when I rolled with him the first time, like when he was 17. Like, don't look, at this, bro. Don't look at me like, bro, like that. Bro, you're, you're <laughs> saying it like. <laughs> Saying it like an AI bot. So, <laughs> it's like I have a gun pointed at your head. He's like, Dima, make sure to say the right thing. Joseph Chen is one of is one of the most skilled jujitsu practitioners that I ever saw. And not only because he like looks stuff up from instructions, he does his own stuff. He doesn't even realize it. He looks at loose passing from Gordon Ryan. And then he does his own kind of loose passing. And then I explain it to him and he's like, oh, where did you find this? Bro, you're doing it all the time. So he does a lot of cool stuff and stuff that works and also knows for 80, 90% what he's doing there. So that's really unique. But when it comes to competition, he had a big, big problem to transfer every skill, okay? He had some skills where he was really confident and the other skills where he should be really confident because he's still beating everyone up in the gym with it, he couldn't bring it to the table. He just couldn't. So I think there are a couple problems with that, but one thing that came up to my mind was he was engaging in every guard all the time, okay? And why was it like this? Because he was really good in it. So it doesn't matter if he engaged in your butterfly guard, your reverse delay Eva and your delay Eva. He could basically put pressure from there and pass you. So, but that's the problem. If you train like this, you will compete like this. So against his biggest challenge, Matthias, he did basically the same thing and you can't do it against a high level competitor. You need to adjust your strategy based on their strength, right? So a big part of the training has to not getting entangled. It's not like he's not knowing what he needs to do. It's just, he needs to do it every day to have it in his body, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like a sequence that comes to my mind right now. Because um, I've been studying a lot of like wedging back takes. And in your W and O match against Derek, mm-hmm. um, he, you were trying to do your high step passing. And then he ends up like throwing his legs to outside Ashi um, with a scoop grip. And you were just like, cool, I'm just like, accept this entanglement and like go in for my back take. And you ended up taking his back. Um, but it just sh- kind of shows exactly what you're talking about. Like he's very comfortable with people. Um, entangling his legs but uh, yes. yeah like even if we look at the best rapper in the world Gordon Ryan like you can't even argue it you know that he's the best right now sometimes he trains a little bit not unfocused but he doesn't care if you get his leg if you get his arm and I think that's one of the main reasons why Nicky Rod could catch his leg in there it's not like Gordon Ryan doesn't know what to do there he's the best right he's the best it's just he trains like take my leg, I will escape either way. And he does, right? He does. But in this case, he underestimated him a little bit. And I think if you train, focus all the time, you know what you want to do, and you don't give anything uh, to your partner, it will be really hard to not show that in competition. So that's what we try to do with Joseph. So he's not accepting it, only if he wants to accept it. Yeah, I mean, I think especially in the context of Mateus, like, someone who's, like, so capable of, like, inflicting, like, severe damage. Like, because someone, I think, there's, like, you have to distinguish between the threat of, like, positional advancement and the threat of a sub, right? So, with Mateus, it's, like, the threat of, like, something that'll end the match. Whereas, like, a lot of things, if you, if it's, like, just a positional threat, so, like, there are a lot of competitors who are very good positionally, and they can, like, threaten that, but it's not necessarily going to end the match. So I feel like trying to prioritize that over, like, just wanting to engage. Because, like, obviously, like, I think it is frowned upon when people are more wary upon engagement. Like, people use words like cagey and stuff to describe people. And this is usually not what you want to be associated with. But also, I think there's obviously, like, some utility to it. So, like, practicing that aspect, but then figuring out when and where to like pull the trigger and then start going into offense and engaging more on your terms as opposed to just in general I guess would be something that's more interesting I guess like if you for example look at wrestlers they have a really unique style of passing 
I call it rumble passing, or I called it uh, rumble passing before, and it's a style where you basically have a wrestler stance, you have your head low, you have your hands into the front, and you don't get engaged. So popular people that are doing it are like Dorian, Isaac, and that's what we try to mimic a little bit. It's not like they are afraid of the entanglement, but they choose when to entangle or when to get entangled, rather. Mm-hmm. Is there a situation that comes to mind where you would choose to get a leg entanglement? Is that more like a, like in like the context of the match would um, facilitate like a situation where you would want an entanglement, or is it like a specific position um, that you like encourage them to go to? Thanks for me. Um, I think this is more in terms of strategy. I think this is more for you. It's less technical, more strategic. So there are situations where you can choose either of them, but it depends on the context of what your goals are. So for example, let's let's take Taza. If you're not getting entangled or you're not getting engaged, the threat of standing up is there, right? So I would rather be a little bit closer to him and do my work from there. Or if the lower partner doesn't really have something in this arsenal like a really strong submission so let's say you have Mateus but without his footlock or without his heel hooks i would go in there and try to tire him out because if they are good in the entanglement but they are not good at finishing it and i know that they can sweep me i would purposely go in there to tire them out in this position and if you look at gordon ryan especially um, at his training you see he's doing it if you look at craig he's doing it too like these two come to my mind and we try to mimic it right now. I call it base training, where you go into an entanglement and you try to pressure from there. So you bring your whole weight into your partner and it gasses them out. Even if you look at the recent role of Craig and Joseph, it's not like that Craig is a million times better than Joseph, right? But he tired them out from the entanglement positions and Joseph is really good on getting there. But Craig is really good on staying there and applying his whole weight and pressure. So. In terms of strategy against people like good jiu-jitsu players, but where I know I can put my pressure on and there's not the biggest threat of getting finished, I will go in there. Yeah, and I think also like this is kind of like, there's similar tones to like, um, thinking about like different stages of like offense and defense, right? Like if someone gets me into offense, it's like, I want to be comfortable not just like defending from there, but also being comfortable staying there, not necessarily like having to panic or get out because I think this is a lot of what like what, what you're referring to like I think this type of base training is good because you're basically practicing working from a not necessarily working but being comfortable in a disadvantageous position or like in your opponent's guard we can like argue on like what would be advantageous or disadvantageous but trying to make it so that it's no longer like them winning because they have the guard, but almost that they're getting tired because they have to keep it in place. So I think, exactly. like, if you can make some, like, make a position that was once previously, like, like, let's say very, like, effective and useful and dangerous, and you can kind of, like, negate it, then I think there's a lot of, like, utility in that and how you can start looking to deal with your partner, not just in terms of, like, how you deal with their attacks, but also how you can start to look to move from there. So was the strategy going into ADCC, like, avoid leg entanglements as much as possible? Um, And you you kind of trained that more? Or was it this type of base training um, where you're kind of comfortable, um, like, managing their their leg entanglements? Yeah. So the thing is, especially for Joseph, The biggest thing was the mental barrier, especially against Matthias. So you have to think about it. If you go in there as a teenager to your first major tournament and there's a guy that literally breaks your foot, right? This will stick with you. And I think like we both knew that this is the biggest heritage, right? So I was thinking we need to structure the camp, especially for Matthias. To be honest, I'm, I was confident that Joseph is good enough to beat everyone in the 77 division, but I also knew we need to beat the mental barrier. So that's why we trained of not getting entangled. 
but we wanted actually to get entangled with most people. I think the only two people we didn't want to get entangled was Tommy and Matthias. Tommy, because he's really good with his matrix style type of guard, especially if you high, uh, high step pass. Like you can watch the stuff on B team, I think. It's Nicky Ryan with Tommy, and you see Nicky Ryan loves the high step, right? Nicky Ryan is one of the most gifted passers in Jiu Jitsu, but Tommy entangled every time. So every time Nicky did a high step, Tommy entangled. So we wanted to avoid that, and I think Joseph did it masterful. So again, to answer your question, we only structured the camp basically for Mateos, and because Joseph spent his whole life basically getting entangled. So just that, that he's prepared. Everything else, he was already prepared. He's prepared to go in there and give your leg and stay happy. So that was the reasoning behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what helped was like, like skill selection or like move selection. Because I feel like a lot of the times, like a lot of these approaches are contradictory. So like, Engaging and then also being wary of engagement are almost two opposite ways that you can start looking to approach passing. But then, like this, like picking the appropriate time to do what I think was one of the main things. Because I, th a lot of people will say it's like, oh, um, when you compete, it's like you want to bring the opponent into your game, right? And you don't want to think about what their game is. But I also do think there's some validity to it, especially the better your opponents get, right? So like for, especially for someone like the course who are specialists you de definitely want to try avoid it obviously not to compromise your own game uh, but just so that um, let's say you don't necessarily play where they're very strong and I think like what helped me a lot was obviously the training and like the some degree of like the mental barrier but it was also just knowing in which matches what techniques I would use because I feel like there's almost like just because I've enjoyed studying a fair bit, but this also, like, I feel like as a result has created a situation where I'm almost too, um, like, um, whatever, or like too carefree in whatever techniques I choose a lot of the time. So like, it'll sometimes just be, oh, okay, I feel like I can do this. It won't be, okay, what's the most optimal or what what's gonna be the easiest path to success or the safest path to, path to success. It's like more what I feel like I'm going to do. And so, like, having that degree of guidance in regards to, um, okay, in these matches, th these are where we can display our game versus w this is where we're going to have to, like, kind of tone it back a little bit. And it, it, it would change for, change for certain matches. Like, um, like, like we said earlier, like, obviously, like, Mateus and Langeco, we definitely wanted to avoid getting entangled because uh, their strength in the entanglements, right? Um... So just figuring out when it is appropriate to do like this and that. And like something else that was like helpful what in which is a similar tone was like um Demo was really trying to emphasize my wrestling. So that, like for example, like in the match with Taza, I wasn't necessarily confident in the wrestling, but he was like just because he seemed like a very like competent wrestler, so I was like, Oh, maybe I'll just pull guard and that kind of carefreeness was something that he like just shot down. He was like, Okay, no, we're not gonna pull even if we encounter some degree of like sh like trouble there we're just gonna like keep going with that game plan because he was like okay he thinks I'll be able to out wrestle in that match so not having that back door of okay oh, fuck it I'll just pull guard again or that, if I feel like there's a little bit of an obstacle just like kind of being persistent to some degree um, if I remember correctly in the Tommy match you did quite a lot of loose passing even though you were worried about getting entangled and it seemed like the only time he really entangled you um was when you had like a near side underhook and he had a scoop grip and you like really had to work to get you entangled and then you were out of there like relatively quickly um is there maybe a strategy or like a like technique specifically that you avoided because like from my perspective, it looked like you were loose passing. Uh, maybe you weren't doing like the high step type passing. Maybe that's what you were specifically avoiding, but um, yeah, you speak yeah. to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, generally, I like to do like a style of like camping where 
like so because it's basically which leg are you leading with are you leading with your inside leg or your outside leg and to some degree like um, like high stepping, I would say it's like you're, you're bringing your outside leg to their hip. And so that, I think, can leave yourself more susceptible to matrixes and stuff like this. So I was really trying to drive in with my near side leg, which from there, I really didn't think there was as much of a threat of a matrix from there. And really trying to crowd his his near side leg in that case, or the, the leg that's closest to me. Because that's what's going to be doing a lot of the entangling and like it's going to be like the first point of engagement so if i'm able to just keep that out of the way so like i would often play with it at my hip especially when i was at the start like i'd try to flank and then kind of keep that foot out of the way by crowding him i think like uh, something i like to think about in terms of loose passing that i'd say is maybe a little bit more unconventional is the range that i like to play at so um i like to play at a fairly close range and this is a slightly off topic where when I flank my partner, if I feel like I'm too far away, depending on the range, it can be too far that they can't use my body to retain guard. But sometimes, usually I'll be at a range where they can entangle me to some degree, and then they can just regard to square up to me. So I'd rather stay so close in that they're not really able to pummel their legs back in. Or like similar to you were saying like with the rum, like rumble passing, like where you're managing the range. I think. It's easiest to do that style of passing when you have a noticeable wrestling advantage. So the, like, the examples you gave, I think the, the, this type of passing where you're very wary on engagement, it does leave the opponent uh, the opportunity to heist, right? And this is something generally I don't want, like, just because it's, I wouldn't say wrestling is my strong suit. So I really like to engage and play super tight in this regard. So that, in the, so for example, in the match with Tommy, I kept my outside leg fairly far, but my near side leg, like, as much as I could, like, crowding him until, like, he did push me away a few times and I had to really, like, change directions. But when I was in there, I was trying to be really in the pocket so that his legs didn't really have space to uh, make frames and push me away, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like you're, it seemed like you did a really good job of balancing the, uh, like, like you said, it's kind of like a two opposing things, like, not getting tangled versus like letting people get up you know it's like mm -hmm. which one do you choose but it seemed like that's a good way of kind of playing the middle ground and kind of balancing the two like you're you're in close enough to kind of keep them down but kind of managing their their leg entanglements well I think that makes but a lot again that's the thing imagine you have an isaac on the ground you will not do 50 50 you will engage so he can stand up so it depends right and with tommy especially like the game plan was no high stepping, outside passing left to the right, force him to the right hip, go to the left. So I really thought this would be a hard match. That that was my and yeah, there was my mind. So when Joseph got the body lock on him, I was shocked. I was really shocked. Like <laughs> no, I was really shocked. I think a lot of people were shocked how he passed him. So that wasn't even the game plan. I thought like we would just win the decision or win maybe with two points or something like that but Joseph was like nah fuck that I'm passing him now he just Amazing. beat Mateus he was on top of the world <laughs> yes. the, the wins are appreciating over time yeah <laughs> <laughs> no but um yeah I mean I think at least the way I, I view like my game in that sense is like I try to use the loose passing to open up the tight passing because what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to like extend establish frames and that's going to create more space for me to start looking and now like start getting like near side under hooks and stuff like and like pinning their shoulders right so i'll try threaten one to open the other up and vice versa right like let's say they're playing tight i don't really have the opportunity to get under hooks then because they're so, like so contracted they don't really have a good ability to make connection on me so then i can start looking to flank from there and work in this regard so i think like like kind of the contrast between the two you can kind of like play between your opponent's reactions i think a lot of like a, like a common theme here is like like based on what your opponent is doing trying to act accordingly like so that's like um like i said earlier it's like not really trying to enforce like my like the specific part of my game but having a game that is kind of flexible enough to work around certain reactions so like whether they're tight or they're loose or if they're um, really trying to stand up or if they're not really doing so and we have to be more wary of my engagement um, 
I guess another potential question I think that will fit well um, would be when you two started working with one another, um, was there any like specific hole in your game um, that you were hoping Dima could help you with? Or basically what did you think like having a coach um, come into your training? How did you see that um, helping you? So I, like, I think we made this agreement when we were prepping for trials in New York and he was helping um, his other student, Linus, um, train. And I, I, I've always like um, talked to him about technique and stuff like this and I, I found like he's pretty good at breaking down matches and basically seeing things that I don't necessarily see. Um, Cause I, I find like studying matches there's like I don't know, some things are more obvious to me than others, and some things are more obvious to him than others. So it, it's interesting how that works. Um, and so I felt like he was very helpful not only in, in that regard, but also in, like... Because something I think about is, like, looking at my own game objectively compared to someone else's game, I'm pretty biased in this regard. So I don't feel... I w- one, I wouldn't necessarily trust my uh, own opinion and thoughts on how like the the trueness of whatever I think so having someone that I I trust in this regard telling me and basically blindly trusting him not necessarily not blindly but like fully okay if he says this I'm doing this and I'm not necessarily questioning what he thinks in this regard was like the biggest thing for me as opposed to like there are some things that we did work on like we did a lot of single leg stuff and trying to do like some like stuff in this regard but it was more uh, being able to see things more objectively but I'm, I'm sure Dima can speak more on this because it's just from my side yeah I think it's just hard to be a coach for yourself like Joseph is, is a smart guy he's a good competitor he's good in jiu-jitsu and he's also a good coach like he could break everything down for most people or for all people and have a good strategy but it's hard to do it for yourself especially if you're someone that has a lot of technique a lot like joseph is good in so many things so my biggest part was to select it right i needed to select it he's like a kid in the candy store i want this i want this i want this i want this no 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 you're eating and then you get your sweets and basically <laughs> that, no for real that was what i did so it, i maybe helped him five to ten percent but i think it's necessary to see the whole picture because sometimes you lose yourself in your own game, basically. That's it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we like zoom out a little bit, and maybe you can just talk more about like your general approach to coaching and strategizing, and um, like just some like prompt questions, like um, how does your strategy change if you're like you know, um, going to compete or coach for, uh, like super fight where there's just one match or like a tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you prepare differently? And, uh, yeah, things of this nature. Yeah. So when it comes to strategy, uh, to have a good strategy. So I write a whole, a whole strategy for almost everybody of a tournament, if it's a tournament. So let's start with this. We can talk about ADCC actually. So basically I picked out, I think, eight or nine names that I thought were likely to be on top, right? Joseph, eight, nine, something like this. I, I can check, but it was something along those lines. Yeah. Like. So I called it Joseph's ADCC hit list. <laughs> and what I do, I want to figure out their strengths, their weaknesses, and the strategy based on Joseph's weakness and uh, strengths. So that's how I approach it. And yeah, I try to not have any emotions on that. I just see what they can do, what they can do, and what Joseph can and can do, and then we do the perfect strategy for it. And it's really important to also find training footage, and it's it's the best if we have recent footage because if you have older footage, sometimes you look up maybe a totally different grappler. And when it comes to a super fight, it's basically the same, just for one guy. So it's appreciated if it's only a super fight, I don't need to work that much because I think I needed 
per person one to two hours and for Mateus I needed like five hours six hours this this was a pain in the ass but yeah we got it done so everything is fine and um, when it comes to coaching um, I don't have a name for my type of coaching I know some people have you it, need to market but, it <laughs> yeah to market it uh, I like to see it like this we try an error and we take everything that works so for now especially I try to develop only few skills for all my students and it's basically not getting entangled staying heavy in an entanglement and then vice versa if you're on bottom the same thing so you try to move your partner and you try to wrap your partner somehow I believe if you have these four skills you don't need to learn any type of guard or any type of pass because everything will come natural to you so that's how I approach my coaching I try to see it as a bigger picture so it's hard to teach every move or every system by itself but if you find the key points of it like holding base getting out of an entanglement not getting entangled holding people down knowing how to stand up if you have these parts you can become really really good in a short amount of time and then techniques will be applied like this opposed to if you try to apply a technique or learn a technique and then try to learn the base or entanglement or control thing so i think this is the hardest part of a coach picking what you're gonna teach and how you're gonna teach it so i think this will be a long journey but i try to see it as small small parts not guard not passing not body lock passing not outside passing just not getting entangled getting entangled that's just one of the themes that i have right now in my mind and then when you got the strategy, the hit list, um, <laughs> how confident were you in that strategy? And then how did you go about um, like developing your skills to implement that strategy in the in the you know time you got it versus like when ABCC trials happened? Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, so I, I think. The benefit to it, it wasn't so difficult to implement just because um, Dima had a f fairly good understanding of what my game was, where my strengths and weaknesses were. So he tailored it to me in that regard. But there were some areas that Brian needed to sharpen up because obviously he's not going to say, he's not going to look at an opponent and be like, okay, I want you to beat him in an area where you're completely terrible at. Because it, it, it just wouldn't make sense, especially in a shorter period of time. Um, but so, like for example, like a lot of the things were like not getting entangled, and this was a, like I think this was the main area in which I was deficient in, and that we had to kind of overcome this problem. Um, so like practicing that was one of my main focuses, and just being wary upon, like engaging and then managing my opponent's ability to engage, and then when they do, like defensive skills from there, like. I think in terms of skills that I, I really had to build up, I would probably say, like, everything that was on the plan was something that I already, um, like, had some idea of doing, but it was more just refining certain skills that I already had. Because especially this was probably, like, a month and a half, two months out from trials. It, I think it would be fairly unrealistic of me to, like, bring something completely new in to my game. Like, something I was trying to do a lot at that point, and... Like this was part of the plan is like, like mixing like passes from on both sides, so like passing to both sides and threatening, and then integrating that with some degree of like pressure passing with like tripod passing and stuff like this. And so, this was an area where I feel like I was, I felt very comfortable in. So it wasn't that there was nothing there, but I really wanted to refine that for like a, in in a com for a competitive setting. Right. So is to uh, to use the. Art of learning language is more the form to lead form type of training. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And yeah, like, yeah. Um, I do think like having a degree of like unconscious, like very intuitive behavior is important for competition. As you want to like, I, I think there's like obviously a component of mental fatigue if you think too much about what's going on, but then also you don't necessarily act in a timely manner. Because if I think about everything I'm doing, um, in a like competition, my opponents already like might be reacting, and um in at a much faster rate that than which I'm acting, and so by the time I decided to do something that's appropriate for this situation, and I consciously do that, it may now be a different situation, and so yeah, so like 
I think one of the first conversations me and Dima connected on was like when we first met was like uh, talking about um, performance versus growth. And this, I, I wouldn't say this is the best terminology for now, but it's kind of, I, I just kind of just stole this from Josh Waitzkin, right? Where it was like, <laughs> I'm either more geared towards performing and like this is similar where it's like two contrasting ideas where it's like a one where I'm going to be very intuitive trying to do things like like unconsciously and trying to do things in a very timely manner versus when you're focusing more on growth and like trying to build new skills it's like you want to be conscious of things you're doing you want to kind of slow things down see where things fit in what you can branch off of and like being a little bit more like creative in this aspect and then just like managing your training in these two regards when you're in the uh the form to lead form one where you're basically trying to make um movements more instinctual and reactionary do you find that you tend to use certain types of media in your study more in that area as opposed to um, like your training phases Um, like for example like when you're trying to sharpen the sword do you tend to watch less instructionals and you know listen to more podcasts or something or is it vice versa where you try and watch more instructionals and pick up little details to help sharpen that sword. Um, yeah. yeah, so for the most part, I definitely like tone down the quantity of instructionals that I watch. Like if I like trying to practice this and I feel like, oh, there's a problem that it's like quite obviously a problem, like that it's consistently catching me off, then I might look for a more technical solution in an instructional or in some tape. But otherwise, it's more like I'll be thinking about more how I want to move and how I want it to look more more than like what is like the practical solution to some of these problems because um, I wouldn't, this is more subjective to me I guess. It's like I, I have an idea of like I'll watch a lot of things especially in the lead up to comp and see okay like for example like some, uh, some wrestlers or some pra- uh, like jiu-jitsu practitioners and I see how they move and I want to like try mimic it, mimic it to some extent because they're they're doing things in a very timely manner and they're doing well the most well an appropriate reaction uh to respond to whatever the opponent's doing and doing that in a fairly like intuitive way a lot of the time so like you see a lot of like Hoffa and Gee like they do a lot of this type of stuff where it's like very movement based but um very appropriate attacks I think right and similar like Gordon is like almost like a, a different thing because it's like I think there's almost so much of a skill gap that the timing isn't... Obviously, I think his timing is good, but I don't think you need to be as quick and as intuitive when you're so much better than your like opponent, mm. if that makes sense. That was more like... I'm not so clear in my thoughts on what I just said in that. It's like kind of like... I'll watch more highlights and stuff like this, but I don't know. That's just the feeling I have. And then how about when you're in the uh, the other phase of training, like or in your the training phase where you're trying to like develop skills? Um, what is your like other types of media that you find most helpful in that phase? Um, podcasts, instructionals, whatever. Yeah. yeah so, uh, like, I think at least just to answer actually the last question a little bit because I didn't really touch on podcasts, but podcasts are usually like what I do more in my downtime um, surrounding jujitsu. So. Like, obviously, I can bring stuff onto the mat from, like, listening to podcasts, but I find that a lot of it is, like, more of the things that uh, aren't necessarily, like, technical solutions because it's, like, it's hard to convey technique through an audio platform. There's all the things surrounding it, so, like, certain ideas, like, obviously, like, I learned, like, a lot of the, uh, I got Josh Waitzkin art learning from listening to a podcast. So a lot of these things and, like, how, how to learn or how to approach training or even like yeah, competition mentality from uh, like podcasts because then I don't necessarily need all of my focus to like like be able to consume this type of media. So sometimes if I'm like like on public transport or if I'm like cooking or something like this, then I can consume this type of media as opposed to like um, when I'm like more like growth, right? Obviously, these things will still be there, but now it's more of like. I'm taking a more active role in what I'm doing where I'm like really trying to see okay, what is someone doing, 
when are they doing something and so on and so on and that'll be then it'll be a lot of tape study or like instructionals where I'm trying to figure out the more like the nitty gritty of what makes up the technique if that makes sense makes total sense yeah um, maybe um, to go back to uh, to Dima here uh, maybe um, do you want to give just like a more just to to kind of like touch on some of your other athletes you know like Jason Rao and and other people um, maybe just a more general approach maybe your uh, I, I don't because you I think you did a good job of explaining honestly your coaching methodology so um, yeah I guess is there anything else you would you want to to add about that yes. I guess so like right now I'm in a pretty weird stage because people of all levels are working with me so for example Jason Rao it's not like I'm his coach it's, he's asking me for a strategy and he wants me to be there for tournaments and right now we're also there where he asked me how he should train like he will not do it 100% but maybe like 5% of my input he will implement in his training so yeah and with Jason like we were at the trials at the west coast no east coast trials west coast east coast trials so and basically it was pretty weird for me because he didn't train like i wanted him to train so we didn't talk about it and he was like Nima, can you help me like strategize and prepare me for trials and i'm like of course but i need to be there and he's like yeah sure so i was flying to the east coast trials and at the warm-up area I was already figuring out what the problem was with Jason's performances. Like if you look at him in the training room, even the best people in the world will tell you, oh, shit, he's pretty good. Like he fucks up most of the people. And yeah, <laughs> just talk to people that train with Jason Raum that are maybe trials champions, world champions, and they will tell you how good he really is, right? But in competition, he lacks success. So at the warm-up area, he was warming up and I saw that he was just sitting. He wasn't even standing up. He wasn't going uh, to his knees. He was just trying to do a leg lock. And then if it's not working, he stopped. And if you look at his past matches, that's how he competed, right? He tried to get a leg lock. People disengaged because, you know, oh, it's Jason Rao. He would probably leg lock me. And then he's just remaining seated. So at the two minutes mark of the warm up, I was telling him, bro, just stand up and run them over. You are one of the best passers in the world. His passing is way better than his leg locks. And his leg locks are amazing. You know, nobody wants to be under Jason Rao. So he tried to do it. Okay, do it quicker. And he did it again, and he did it again. And then after five minutes, we had the real Jason Rao in the room. And I think that's what you saw at the East Coast trials. Especially in the first day, the strategy was to stand up, run them over, pass them, and choke them. And that's what he did. Because everybody knows, okay, Jason will play guard, you will try to get your leg, they will sit down with you. Okay, stand up, run them over, pass them. At the second day, the strategy was a little bit different. I want to uh, talk about the Mayfield match because this was perfect. This, this was really perfect, I think. This analyze is one of the easiest analyze of my life, but he's high level. So, right, Jordan? So, what Mayfield does basically, and you can look at every one of his matches. I love you, Mayfield, I love you, but. He walk, he leaps with his right leg and he puts it on your left hamstring, right? And he just stands there. He has a ridiculous base. And then what he tries to do is to fight the legs with his hand. And if it's not working, he resets the system. So even if you know what he's going to do, he will just reset the system and do it again. And then he will get the right hand underhook and knee cut. Boom. That's how he beat Sebastian Rodriguez, right? So with Jason, it was like, finally, we have someone that will not concede bubble position. If you have him, he will not fall. And then you can actually footlock him. I didn't specifically say, are you okay? That was his thing, but that was, that was basically the game plan. So he steps in, right leg. We try to get it somehow off balance him. He got it off balance him, Ayoki lock, picture perfect. So um, the story is like this. Every high level DJ athlete that has trouble competing has a problem somewhere but you need to figure out the problem for everyone. It's not the same problem. Everyone has a different problem and the roots of the problem basically lay in their training. That was, at Joseph's case, like it was the training, at Raul's case, it was the training too. 
So I try with my athletes, now we come to my athletes like Linus. I think we can only at this stage really talk about him because he's now a little bit known. He beat a uh, new wave black belt, Cameron, that trains for a long time. He trains three times a day, right? And he's really good, like high class. And Linus beat him, beat him as a blue belt, I think. He was 17 or 18 years old and he trained with me Nogi for six months. So think about this. How is this possible? It's not because Linus was better in jiu-jitsu than Cameron. We just had the picture-perfect strategy and we had the rock-solid defense that we developed in the six months. Because we knew, okay, we can't beat the best guys with jiu-jitsu, but we can have a rock-solid defense. And if we have a base, this will be hard to win against them. And yeah, there's basically a little bit more to my approach and to my athlete. If you look at Linus, like he helped Joseph a lot with the preparation too, because another hole in Joseph's game, game was his confidence in the standing position. Because it's not because of technique, but he wasn't confident that he's not getting gassed, right? So after the experience with Kenta, where he got really gassed, he doubted himself, but he doesn't need to because his wrestling is amazing. You, you see soon or you already saw it. So we just needed to modify the training, and that's what we did. We brought Linus. Linus, his gas tank is crazy. He can go for days. We call him like, what's the name? Like, the so train. Hmm? Which one? The engine, right? We, we call the engine, right? So if you know, if you see Jay Rod, it's it's a similar thing. But Linus is not stopping. He's going one hundred percent the whole time, and we did that for. Joe's preparation also, being there in a single leg, tiring him out and getting him confident. So if you have a problem as a competitor, uh, uh, as a competitor and you're really good in training, but you can't put it out on the stage, you have a problem somewhere, find it. And it probably to 99% of the time lays in your training. Makes total sense. Um, maybe uh, one last thing that I think people like um, is when I uh, like listen to what the coach is telling the athlete during the match and then kind of highlight that um, as far as like a technical perspective or like a strategy perspective. Um, is there anything um, that you can remember? Or maybe on a general, a general question would be like, what type of verbal commands are you, do you tend to give your athletes when you're like cornering them during a match? And then is there anything like specific to Joseph that you remember saying um, that you think would be kind of cool to highlight in the video? Reset the system. I think that's the most Yeah, I, I maybe said millions of times, <laughs> reset the system. And the cool thing is Joseph actually resets the system. So if I see him like sleeping almost and just, he, if he's engaging, he goes into the mode like, okay, I'm doing jujitsu. But if I don't want him to do jujitsu, I want him to reset it and then do jujitsu. Sometimes he forgets about it, so I call reset the system, and then you actually see him standing up, going back, and doing all over again. But if you really want to highlight a cool thing, I think the coolest thing was when he has a scoop. Was it a scoop pass on Matthias? Like uh, when you put the knee in? Like you know the, I mean? Kind of like the cross scoop stack pass thing. Yeah, if you uh, hear closely, you can uh, hear me yeah, you screaming. Me. Yeah, use your knee, use your knee, and then he puts his knee in and almost passes Mateos. Ooh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Awesome. That was, that was useful yeah. cornering. I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, I'll use my knee. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, man, I've had another question, but I just forgot it. Anything else you can think of? I think something cool is like, Joseph was really, like, I don't know how I could put it right, but yeah, he was worried and anxious. And after the Mateus match, he was like, he's coming up to me, he's like, I think I can win this. Can, can we win this? And I'm like, don't think about winning. So that was a cool moment too. Like he, he became happy all over again. It's like, oh, we can win it, we can win this. And yeah, sometimes we need to slow things down to concentrate on the next opponent. Right. One at a time. That's funny. Um, I remember but the even, question. Oh, sorry. Go. Yeah. No, yeah, you go. Yeah. Uh, even I, I was really confident that he can and will win it. 
when I met him, when he was 17 years old, he talked about like, oh, maybe I can win trials. And I was like, I think you will not win this trials, but like in two years you will win it. That's one of the first things I told, uh, told him. And so I really knew it in my mind that he will win it. I really knew it. But when it actually happened, you can see how happy Joseph is. Look at me in the background on this <laughs> final match. I'm like, fuck, it actually happened. What the fuck? I, I could see it. I could see it in front of my eyes. So I knew it. My, my main job was to tell Joseph what I saw and that he believes in it. And I'm really lucky that I found Joseph because he actually believes in me. And so he believes in, in himself. And he blindly did what I told him. And it was, it was perfect. And again, I'm not telling him everything that he does. He already knows it. He already does it. I maybe give him 5%, 5 or 10%. And because of Joseph, because he listened to it, like, that's a good athlete. Amazing. And everything worked out perfectly. Beautiful. Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty apparent. I called it out in my video, but, like, yeah, it was, it was cool to see. Like, at, at the end when, uh, like, Joseph used, like, the Uchimata to, like, take Taza down, like, everyone was like, yeah, and then he tried, like, that back step, and everyone was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> everyone, was on, everyone was on Joseph's team, for sure. Cool yes, that, that was a fucked up scene actually because I was screaming Uchimata, Uchimata, and Uchimata, <laughs> and then he landed in the back position. I'm like, oh shit, what did I done? But I, I'm really confident from there. If you see Joseph in this position, oh no, I, I will not give the secret out. No, no, no. <laughs> Get him in this position. He's gone. He sucks. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> yeah, you could tell he was confident when he was trying to backstep on Taza. It's like, yeah, he's feeling it. Um, I guess uh, one, one question I think will, will like, I think kind of tie everything uh, together, going back to like where you were saying like reset, reset. Um, when, like were you saying reset basically when you felt like he was getting too close to a leg entanglement that you wanted to avoid? Um, was that kind of your cue to say like, hey, get out and uh, kind of reset the system? Yeah, so it's not like I'm not confident that he can win there, but the best path to win against Tommy and uh, Matthias, I think I only did it there uh, on these two, is to get away, have a little bit of distance. We know that they will not wrestle up, right? Tommy maybe, but he was a little bit closer with Tommy. And then you grab the legs, you fake to the left, you go to the right. And from there you can do your all of your jiu-jitsu. Like, not that I'm not confident, but the best path in my opinion was to stay outside and then go in we go in on our terms and I, I just to add on that I think a lot of like especially resetting like at least from my understanding a lot of the time it was when we ended in a more neutral passing position as opposed to putting someone on the back foot so I think resetting it we were much able to resetting the system per se we were much more able to elicit a defensive response on our opponents like and because if I just stay in a split squat, this is kind of a position where my opponent can chill, recompose themselves, and figure out, okay, how am I going to attack from here? Versus when I manage to reset and I go back into, like, like, like I, I think this is, like, the whole selling point on J-point camping, right? Because you have to elicit, a, like, a fairly strong defensive reaction. So basically trying to do that over and over and not just, okay, I'm going to split squat, I'm going to chill here a little bit. I'm going to give up the split squat and go back into camping, so that I can really try to one like, like to some degree like try to fatigue them, but also just keep keep them in a defensive cycle. That makes a lot of sense. I can see the footage in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. but, yeah. yeah. Anything else? Anything else you guys want to add? I think I think it's good. Not really. I think we have something. Um, yeah, I think pretty comprehensive, I guess. Yeah, we were really professional, right? Yeah. Right, Joseph? Yeah, we could have gone a lot worse. <laughs> yes, yes, we did a good job of, yeah, not going too far. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we have a tendency to, t like, spiral into very yes. retarded conversation. <laughs> like him. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. but luckily not in front of a camera. Like, uh, I think on the way to trials, we almost killed each other because we had, we had a debate about who's smarter, Einstein or Tesla. Yeah, we, uh, we hate each can... other. <laughs> what were the, yeah. but, who's on whose side? But we settled it. 
Who was on whose side? Like, did you think Tesla or Einstein was smarter? I think Tesla is smarter. <laughs> yeah, but... But we, we settled because we said Kenta will decide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ken- no, but Kenta is actually a good background for it, right? Ah, uh, Kenta has like a like a I think a bachelor's in physics, so maybe he's biased though. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, well, I, I, I won. He doesn't know Tesla, or how <laughs> else could he say Einstein? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He didn't know who Tesla was, and then he he said Einstein. That's true. You know, the same thing happened to uh, today, where he like, I think I scratched J, and then. Um, what's it called? And then he's like, look, he did these to me too. And I'm like, I didn't do those to you. And he's like, ah, I don't know. And then I was like, what? <laughs> God, that was funny. This is that litmus test question we were asking about the relationship between coach and athlete. Oh, yeah. Just individually, what is, um, like, what's, what's your answer on this? As short a words as possible. So don't go, like, 10 minutes giving an answer. But, uh, Dima, if we asked you... What makes Joseph such a good athlete or a good competitor? That's still recorded. Okay, let me put it in a uh, short sentence or something like this. Uh, a good athlete coach relationship or a good athlete is someone that has confidence in what you say and listens. I think that's the, that's the biggest part. Having confidence in the coach and listens. Same for the coach, having confidence in the athlete and yeah, that's basically it. Nice. And I guess to flip it, what makes a good coach? I think someone who you trust their opinion on, I would probably like, like, because if you like second guess it, then there's like a little bit of doubt in your mind where you can kind of almost deviate from the plan or not have full faith in it. And let's say you don't have full faith in it, the plan and you don't trust it, then that can lead to situations where, oh, you're not maybe not going to commit like to this or commit to the plan so like for example if something that have happened previously with me and like I've done it in matches plenty of times where it's like I'm having trouble in the standing position I'm like fuck it I'll, I'll pull guard this was something that Dima told me okay don't pull guard in certain matches and I just I would refuse to pull guard and then that really like we, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier and then that would really force me to like not just concede for no reason and so mm-hmm. Having trust in like his judgment in this regard, knowing that okay, I, I trust him. I'll do that, and I'll do it to the extent that I'm capable of, and not just kind of because sometimes if you're not really sure what your like the best path to victory is, you might not wholeheartedly do something. You might do just like show it a little bit, but not actually commit to it, and that can lead to like a lot of failure in a lot of aspects. Mm. I'd say so. Yeah, someone you can trust and someone. Like, not not just like obviously like trusting them as like a friend, but it's more like trusting their opinion and their understanding of like the game that you're playing. When you said uh, show it a little bit, you like flexed your foot. Did you have a specific like sequence in mind or a match in mind when you when you were like show it a little? Bit? Show. I mean, <laughs> I think actually I, I didn't even know I did that. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, I was just like you know how like sometimes in the standing position you'll you'll show certain moves and uh, like just like kind of elicit a reaction. Cool. So I was like thinking like showing like some foot sweep. Okay. Yeah, it's just funny that. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that I think is really really important, like especially in the coach uh, student relationship, is we need to understand that the outcome is it doesn't matter doesn't matter what the outcome is like we shouldn't have too much emotion about it i i always tell to everyone that i coach or that i go out with is we take our wins like we take our losses so i think if we if we think like this it will be way easier then you don't think about if i do this i will lose and then my coach is mad at me or if i say something wrong and he does it and then he loses he will be mad at me like it's it's a bond and we need to respect it yeah for sure you guys kind of flipped the question on me honestly um a, a bit, make it maybe make it easier because we're trying to get at a specific thing but um dima if i ask just um why has joseph been so successful yeah 
<laughs> talent needs opportunity. So there are a lot of talented people, but not everyone has opportunity. And there are a lot of people that have opportunity, but they don't have talent. And the first thing, work ethic. Opportunity, talent, work ethic. That's Joseph Chen. Nobody works harder than him. He doesn't have the biggest talent, but he has a lot of talent. And he doesn't have the biggest opportunity, but he has opportunity. So yeah, work ethic is the biggest trait, but you need all three to make a champion. Chinese sweatshop work ethic. <laughs> 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 well, I'm Chinese, I'm German, like South African, Taiwanese. <laughs> I, just, I thought of that, I couldn't help but say it. <laughs> and then, same question to you. Yeah? Why do you think you've been so successful so far? I honestly think there's a lot of luck to do with it. Like, obviously, like, there is a, like, I enjoyed it. Um, obviously, like, I had a motive, like, I think a lot of my motivation, like, to train and improve in jiu-jitsu was never, like, it was never competition-oriented. So it was more just, I was curious and I wanted to take it further. So, like, I've n- none of my goals in jiu-jitsu have ever been, oh, I want to compete, like, oh, I want to win this competition or I want to get to this competition. It was never been, com- like, competition-oriented. Obviously, like, some of my goals in training can be geared towards this, like, okay skills like related to ADCC or IBGF but the motivation for it came from like mostly like curiosity and just I enjoy like having better jujitsu I find it very like satisfying and gratifying to pursue like this avenue of thought per se so like when I find something new I'm like wow this is so interesting I find it like super fun just to figure stuff out and understand something to a uh, greater degree so like I'll, I'll be working like uh, that's why I also think I have like my game is kind of weird in the sense where it's like I'll play bottom top I'll wrestle maybe a little bit and I feel like that also can end up like this is why I think you was helpful where it's like I kind of lack direction in some sense especially competitively where I'm like I don't know if I'll pull I don't know if I'll wrestle I don't know if I'll play top or bottom and I think that's like as a result of like just how I approach training because it, it's not necessarily geared to okay I'm gonna do this competition, so I'm only gonna do the skills. It's like my own curiosity will make me try to pursue. Like, oh, like uh, like recently I like omoplata, so I'm gonna play with a lot of omoplata. It's just because, like, oh, I think there's something interesting there. Right? It's not necessarily, oh, I really want to win, so I'm gonna. This is this is like a lot of the reason of my like, uh, yeah, my, my game is the way it is, and I think obviously, the support of like my mom allowed me to do it. So, some degree. <laughs> in that regard, like, I got lucky in terms of, like, I, I got a sponsor when I was back in China, so that helped me um, come out here and be able to, like, one, train and compete internationally. Without that, I wouldn't have been able to make it out. So, a lot of, like, on the, honestly, COVID also, that was helpful for me. <laughs> uh, like, Thanks, it destroyed my life, but for you, it was great. It was great for me, honestly. When's the next quarantine? <laughs> no, but the thing is, I was quarantined. COVID made me better in jiu-jitsu. This should be the fun yeah. <laughs> But honestly, during the COVID, I was stuck in Taipei, and the borders were closed, but everything in Taipei was fine. So I was training. I had no school. I was training every day. And then also, I could, you could maybe contribute this to um, like the prevalence of uh, pirating instructionals in China, where I was like 15 years old, I didn't really have money to buy instructionals, but they're all pirated, so I could watch all of them. So I, I try to give back a little bit more now, like I'll pay for like certain subscriptions, but just because I feel a little bit bad, but it definitely helped me back then. So like... I was able to train every day, no school, watch instructionals, and then, yeah, I got, that was like my first taste of like training full time. Because beforehand, um, before COVID, I didn't really, it was just, I trained like two, three times a week. So, yeah. Um, just because you said that, um, you were saying that you're more focused on the process, on the creativity, and what makes you like intellectually uh, stimulated by what you're doing in Jiu Jitsu. So, in your process, everybody who competes goes through the anxiety of competing that day. Do you think that 
I think because honestly, I think most people are so concerned with I have to win, I have to beat this guy, and that's what their main emphasis is is on is on the procedure, but more on the outcome. Mm-hmm. Like I have to win, and I feel like that kind of makes people shit to bed sometimes, make them like freaked out on what they have to get done. Do you feel like that your approach to it helps you with the anxiety of competing? Yeah, I mean, I've never like wins don't really make me super happy, and losses don't really devastate me. So it's like. I feel pretty similar. Like, obviously, I'm definitely happier. Mateus was a different thing because my <laughs> foot was pretty injured. So that was, like, I was pretty sad about that. But, like, losing in general, like, I've lost many times. And I've never really taken any of them too hard. Like, I think a lot of the times that I have lost, it's been because I've been trying to win and I limit my game a little bit. So, like, uh, a great example is, like, my match with Andrew Tackett at ADCC Open. Like, that match, I was like, oh, my God. I First of all, I was like... The day I was like, oh, fuck. I, I didn't really want to compete. And then I was like, okay, with Tackett, I'm just going to try to sweep him and win by two points. This is all I want to do. <laughs> so I, I was just retaining guard and regulation points. And I'm like, I try 50-50 sweep. And then he gets to reverse mount and I turtle on each other. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So, like, I guess, like, it doesn't, that like, that's a good example of, like, I think really limiting my game because of the outcome. And so that... There, there are like examples. I think that was like probably the match that comes to mind when I think of that. Otherwise, it's usually like uh, I haven't really thought like that. In other in any other match, like all my other losses were pretty much technical. But that one was like I think was I definitely had a distinct change in how I thought about competing for that competition. Because that one was like I didn't want to compete just for whatever reason. It wasn't like any. But that one, yeah, definitely try like I try to show my jiu-jitsu more than I try to win per se like obviously we have like winning in mind that's why we game plan and stuff like this but not to the detriment of like okay we're not gonna or that's our main goal I, I try to like even like with my matches with Tommy and Shizinski I wanted to display like like good jiu-jitsu per se and I feel like working towards that ideal really helps like my, my goal is always okay I just want better jiu-jitsu and whatever path I end up on that's that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Hopefully the audio is good. <laughs> I hope so. I, I'm, I'm well, sure I, I feel like I feel like we could talk for 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I've probably talked cool. to you for 20, more than 20 hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, you guys have more questions or do we have everything? Um, the only thing maybe for Dima that I could think of is because we were just mm-hmm. talking about Kenta. Um, I don't mm-hmm. know if you want to kind of just talk a little bit about him mm-hmm. as well. Talk shit. He's upstairs. Yeah. I'm going to wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Kenta too much. <laughs> yeah, maybe talk about his prep um, maybe a little bit. Um, just maybe your co- coaching methodology uh, maybe towards him and I can just kind of like See if I can fit it in. Yeah, so Kenta does his own thing, basically, I think, Mm. right now, right? I I wrote him something. I don't know to which extent he's doing it, but what we did in Bali, I think, like, that's where he really did what I uh, was planning for him. We did a couple single leg rounds because he wasn't confident in the single leg that he has and then the single leg defense. But I think, again, after two or three minutes, we just fixed one problem with the hand, like the hand gripping. And after that, he escaped every single leg uh, attack. So I don't know if Kenta needs me really. Like, I think he's already the best 77 77 guy in Asia. Uh, Joseph is a German, right? (laughs) So I'm really confident about his skill. Like, he's a really good human being, good jiu-jitsu athlete. He always wants to know new things. He always trains, like... Uh, yeah, he's always thirsty for more jiu-jitsu and I think he will do really good in, at the trial. Yeah, I feel like at least me and Kenta, most of our training is like, I'll do something and then he'll do something in response and then we basically, our jiu-jitsu works less each time we roll and so we have to f- like try on like, oh fuck, Kenta did this to me today, I have to figure out how to deal with this and this is like, basically our whole relationship in jiu-jitsu is just like because like yeah, there are definitely periods of time where it's not good for me, and then it'll be good for me, and then it'll not be good for me again. So I think I feel like this is like kind of like, like the essence of what you want in jujitsu. Like 
guess. Yeah, Kenta is a great addition to, like, to us. Like, he's a really great friend, and I think without him, we would suck more at jiu-jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, definitely. But you guys met by competing against each other? Yeah. Fuck yeah. I was like, you fuck Joseph up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that when you're walking around the house and you're like, <laughs> no, fuck that. <laughs> That's past well, that point. <laughs> now he beats three veterans, right? Show me one trials round where someone beats three recent ADCC vets. Show me one. I don't think we have anyone except of uh, this guy there. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys think we talk too much? No, no. it was good. Almost. <laughs> I think we almost have two hours. I think. No, it's, two uh, hours it's an hour and twelve. That's bad. Okay, but that probably all of that, only five to ten minutes, will make it into the video. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I I feel like the like longer form content on my channel hasn't done very well, like view wise. You just put it up there for for the for the folks though. Like for the eight guys who wanna watch it, watch it. Yeah, that's true. Sick. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, no, no, bro, it's not true. It's not true. Like today, I think seven or eight people out of Germany wrote me, You're on this new video, you're on new on the new new video of Lesson Press More Involved. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> 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 no. so, I think I think you have a lot of fans. I think your channel is one of the best in YouTube when it comes to BJJ, but sometimes the algo is fucking around, right? If you put in something like new school against old school or greatest grappler alive, you have 500k views. <laughs> it's that simple. Look at your, look at, no, no, look at your channel. I mean, specifically your channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you you highlighted the one where I said, uh, I just, it was like my most controversial title that I, oh, I still get negative comments about this title where it's like black belts don't use side control or something like that. Because uh -huh. I basically yeah, like twisted Craig's words a little bit. Or like, or like this is how you beat Gordon Ryan. Right. You're like, yeah. yeah. But that's the game you need to play, right? The yeah. more people comment, the better the video will perform. And a lot of, a lot of haters comment more than people that like you. So, yeah. That's why it works. just hurts. I try, I, just, <laughs> I try to go through some. I, I found a guy today talking shit, and I was like, I put some crying faces next to him. Like, <laughs> if you look at the video, like we did one video where it was Blue Belt Beats, New Wave Black Belt, and the comments were hilarious. Like, that's that's another new wave. There are plenty of new waves. He's like, this yeah, is not a new wave world. guy. He doesn't even train at new wave. It's a different new wave. <laughs> You see him training with gongs. <laughs> Who is this guy then? Oh, uh, dude, if you want, you want, you want hits, just put a, just do a video on like, uh, on standard jujitsu and just write like, ecological method is just situationals. I don't know. Just like stir pot for sure. <laughs> What's it called? There was one comment. He's like, oh, this guy only wins match the, the the same video. It's like this guy only wins a match by not doing real jujitsu. He didn't score. No submission. I'm like, bro, you must hate a lot of high level grapplers for not getting <laughs> yeah, subs. Shit. I'm like, bro. <laughs> He's got a picture of Andre on as well. Like, you also wrote that thing, he will never <laughs> yeah. be a world champion. Yeah, because world champions tr uh, do this, right? Yeah, he'll never be a This is a comment. He will never be a world champion because he's not doing like some sub like submission. Something along those lines because it's not real jujitsu per se. I'm like, bro. How. I'm just saying. And he should be shit posting on the internet instead. That would make him way better. Bro, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, they were funny. I, I went through a bunch of them and tried trolling them. Fuck. Yeah, I'll yeah. back and imagine. I've, I've gotten like a few hate ones and those, rock, like, I'm like, I still remember that. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I'm, I'm sure you must get a fair bit. It's like. It, it hurt me more in the beginning. Like, yeah. especially when I didn't have like good audio. <laughs> People would just make fun of my voice so much. <laughs> it makes me super self-conscious. Yeah, no, those ones hurt. And, and uh, when it's just one person, like you can write it off, like oh, that guy's a jerk. But then there's like seven people saying the same thing. It's like oh god, yeah. this is an actual problem. <laughs> cool. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for for setting all this up. Thank you for doing. Of course, I think yeah, I think this helps every one of us. My mom uh, loved your yeah. video. Oh, nice. <laughs> My mom was like, "This video is so amazing." He's like, like. 
But I was like, can you please ask him to do this for all your matches? <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not how it worked. But she's like, he makes me understand everything. I'm like, great, I'm glad you like it. That might go in this video. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, you're known around the world and people love your video. You need to understand this, that you do something really, really good. Thank you. Like, like Joseph needs to understand that he's better than you think he is. You need to understand that you're doing really good content. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're really good at giving people confidence. Yeah, I can right. Tell. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, He's good I'm, at it. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also good at shattering the confidence because if you don't do something right, I will tell it. I, I sometimes I don't have a switch off. Like you can ask my girlfriend; she's sitting there and looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it there? Uh, almost twelve. Midnight. Nice. Yeah, I I couldn't sleep yesterday. I don't know why. I have a bad time sleeping recently. I think I I overdid it with training and watching tape. <laughs> I think I only chill one hour a day or two hours, and the rest I'm sleeping or watching jujitsu or doing jujitsu. Crazy. Yeah, not good. good about it. Not good. <laughs> you, you would probably know, right? <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. I I was like. I was like, okay, I actually don't watch that much tape. I, I used to think, I'm like, oh, I watch a fair bit of tape. <laughs> and then, uh, like, your YouTube videos, I'm like, you when you went through the, what's the one, the, what's the organization, PG? PGF. I've never watched it. I'm like, what is this? And then I had to go through, I'm like, these are all matches I've never seen. <laughs> i like. It's like professional grappling, but then, like, half to 75% of them are, like, not as good and then you have a few guys who are just going to run through it and create highlights and it's going to be sick looking you know it's awesome you're like sign me up dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was part of the deal when brandon asked to sponsor me he was like oh yeah he was like i just want to get some exposure to pgf oh. and i was like yeah i'll watch the event i'll make a video about i still make a sick video joseph chan submits 40 people in a row yeah, with PGF. Exactly. <laughs> i wouldn't have the gas tank for that <laughs> You gotta believe in yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Dima if you have the gas. Exactly. What Dima? Your round with Craig, your three rounds. What the fuck happened there? Same thing that happened in Bali, bro. But you were chilling. You just let it happen. You're like, okay. Bro, it it was too hard to. Oh, right, well, we can, okay. We'll call later and we'll rewatch the whole, the whole video. But bro, I can tell you what I was thinking through most of it. It was terrible. But you, have, you had three instances, three, where you could have scored for real. Like, in three, in three rounds, I only had three instances. That's pretty hard. When every other instance, I'm just getting raped. Only, okay, okay, but look at Craig. He was giving it all, and you, you were breathing pretty fine after the three rounds. So you were chilling. I, I'm, like, I, I'm were pretty chilling. sure I was quite tired. Well, no, it, really? but also I can't be that tired when all I have to do is just tap. You know, it's like I don't even have the chance to escape. It's like, oh, I try to escape a little bit, but there's no more. There, I can't do it anymore. I, I don't think he can fuck up a white belt as bad as he fucked up. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll, we'll, we'll watch it and we'll discuss. We'll talk. Okay. Tell me.